Yeah. Yeah, just excuse the coughing. I'm in the process of losing my voice. Um, <coughs> sorry. So my name is Esther Fagelson. I've just finished an MSc at the University of York about maybe three months ago. So hopefully this is still fresh enough that I can actually talk about it. Um, I did my dissertation on the use of lithic reduction sites as evidence of the progression of forethought and planning, and in particular looking at this thing called mental time travel, um, and whether it's really relevant to look at that in the Paleolithic and how we can look at that. So I'll take you through my dissertation and highlight some key cognitive features and things that I just found really cool, and hopefully other people do too. So a quick overview, I'll give you a background to the field because I realise full thought and planning is well known but mental time travel is really not. Um, I'm then going to try and explain what that is and how it works. Uh, I'll talk about the Chain Apertoire as a the theoretical approach and how I created my own version of that because I also had a lot of problems with this area of theory. I'll then talk about my two case sites which are Luckalile and Boxgrove. <coughs> I'm going to focus more on the Boxgrove stuff because I just there was a lot more to say about it. I'm going to put this in the wider context of cognitive archaeology and cognitive theory and then I'll give you a brief summary and also highlight some problems I have with cognitive evolution as a whole. Um, <coughs> sorry. So what is the research so far? Well, research in mental time travel studies and in forethought planning is limited to just that, mental time travel studies of modern day humans and chimpanzee comparisons and also sometimes corvids which are things like scrub jays and ravens. There's very little archaeological research. It's limited to things like archaeological raw material transfers. And pretty much throughout the past 35 years, you'll notice the same seven or eight names coming out because no one is studying it, except this handful of authors who is doing really <coughs> intense research, but they're publishing the same ideas again and again and again because no one is really jumping in and doing anything else. <coughs> Sorry. I also found that in terms of archaeology, people were only looking at the start or the end of the chain repertoire and not looking at the whole tool life. They really focused on the end of a tool's life, so the deposition of a hand axe, and also the start of it, so collecting the raw material. And that's a good start, I think, but they're only doing it at these famous sites, so Hadar, Olduvai Gorge, and um, Gona are the only ones really used. And people keep revisiting those sites, which is interesting, but I don't feel we're getting any new information, so I tried to pick other sites that well, were famous enough that I actually had some reading to do because I couldn't access the materials myself weren't done in this way before. <coughs> Sorry. So I'm now going to take you through what declarative memory is. That's the voluntary memory as opposed to non-declarative, which is just sort of, you happen, it happens you don't realise you're doing it. And I'm going to talk about it in relation to forethought and planning. So please raise your hand if you remember what you did yesterday. I really hope so. I know I haven't had a hazy <laughs> right, night, but you know, keep your hand raised if you know or if you can picture what you're doing tomorrow. You rough idea, or you can kind of work it out. You guys have just mentally time travelled. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? <laughs> no, it's not. We do it every day. I'm doing it now. Um, simply put, mental time travel is the ability to move backwards and forwards in time through episodic, the I have done memory, and perspective, I will do memory. Um, more complicated is this. Um, so it's a key component of forethought and planning. The term was, the term was first coined in 1997 by Suddendorf and Corvallis, although I was convinced I came up with it in March. <laughs> Not true. And while they have a lot of research on it, in the past 20 years, they are the only two people that have actually looked at it within the human element. A lot of people are looking for it in animals, but all they're doing is citing back to these same two people. So what we do is we reconstruct past personal events using this episodic I have done memory and we construct possible future events with prospective memory using learning as part of that. <coughs> this works in conjunction with higher level theory of mind, semantic memory, which was memory for facts about the world, um, automatic consciousness, which is a kind of self-awareness that we have that animals maybe have, maybe don't have, who knows. Um, language capabilities and the ability to differentiate between um, present mental state and the imagined mental state. And that last bit is the bit that I'm interested in but can't see in the archaeology. So if anyone has any ideas at the end, that would be great. So an example of how we are always doing mental time travel without realising is that I am currently giving this talk. So I'm aware of it. That's autonomic consciousness and present state. 
I'm aware of the room I'm in, that's semantic memory. I can hopefully gauge your enthusiasm, that's higher level theory of mind. Um, I'm really looking forward to going to bed because I am exhausted, that's perspective memory and imagined mental state. All the while, I am thinking about my really bad hangover and the cold that I am getting, which is unfortunately episodic memory and terrible hindsight, all of which leads us to mental time travel. And so I think it's worth realising that we are all mentally time travelling all of the time and no one realises it. But is it uniquely human? In a word, no, but also yes, because all animals do backwards mental time travel to some degree, but it's the forward mental time travel that no one really understands, and a problem with that, animals don't speak, and when they do speak, in, like when we teach them Yerkish, which is the lexicon, lexigraph language or gorilla sign language, they always talk in the now and have really difficulty um, understanding concepts of time. And I don't know if that's because they have difficulty understanding the language or the actual concept of time. Again, that's another, if anyone wants to do that research topic, go for it. So research has taken two forms. It's childhood studies or primate bird studies. The childhood studies show that age, uh, children aged four up can really easily report what they did yesterday and predict what they, did, they will do tomorrow, just like you guys did. And that's because their brain is really rapidly developing at age four. They have language and dream centers. They can invent and align, which is crucial for this present state, imagined state area of the brain. Three and under, they can just about recall events. They cannot predict events, and it's kind of adorable because there are these videos. They're like, what are you doing tomorrow? Silence. They just repeat what they did yesterday. They assume every day is the same. Um, and then the other side of things is animal studies. The most famous is the scrub jay study, which scrub jays only really eat two kinds of food when kept in cap captivity. It's wax worms and peanuts. The wax worms go off quicker, so when they cache the food and recover it, they know that after day three they can't recover the wax worms, it's gone off. So that shows semantic memory that they're aware that food goes off but also episodic memory. I remember where I buried it. I remember when I buried it. I know that there's no point going back for it. But then I, we don't know if they have automatic consciousness, so I don't know how aware they are aware of what they're doing. And we also don't know how they're predicting into the future. When's the best time to bury the food? When do I want the food? That sort of thing. Um, this is related to the bischoff kohler stuck in time theory, which is the idea that animals are stuck living in the present and can only make immediate planning choices but not anticipatory planning choices. <coughs> Sorry. So the best way to study an entire reduction sequence, which is what I was doing because I was looking at stones, is through the chain repertoire. I found no suitable method for doing this, so I decided to try and create my own. Um, a background, the chain repertoire is a methodological tool for analysis of step-by-step -step production sequences. Um, such as tool making or pottery is the other one that gets used a lot. It's unique as it places emphasis on every stage of the tool life and you don't have to go in order of making but you can jump around which is quite nice because if you don't have every aspect of the tool life in front of you, you can make inferences. Unfortunately, researchers only use it for descriptive purposes. When they do, they don't talk about it as an evaluation of the tool, they just use it as a way to describe what's happened to the tool or like I said before, they look at the start and the end and nothing in the middle. So I come up with two fly, uh, flow diagrams to try and combat this. The one on the right is a rough guide to a standard chain of repertoire of any pre-hafted tool, going from stage one raw material selection all the way through to stage five. Yep, stage five, which is um, removal from context. So that either it's been like deposed somewhere else, it's been taken away, it's been brought into a site, it's it's out of place and it's weird, and that comes back a lot in box grove. And I thought it was best to have some sort of key questions so that if anyone ever wanted to use this again, they can apply it to any site. It's not just something that works for only my case sites. The other thing I did is I created planning stages and they go from one to seven. The first one being no planning, Binford's idea of rooted foraging just as and when need it. Two to four is simple planning and I split those into short, medium and long term. These are solo effort, minimal action required, not a lot of planning, but more than no planning. And the bottom three are complex, again, split into short, mid and long term. But they have multiple stages, such as tool creating. There's <coughs> two or more people required, because sometimes you need help getting the raw material. And 
what I think is most important mentioning is that for both simple and complex, the long-term planning um, is when it's long after the action. That's anything from a couple of days to years. <coughs> so my two case sites. Uh, I did a diachronic pilot study, so that means that they were spatially distinct, temporally distinct, species distinct, although there is no known species for Lokalile, so I chose to leave out species because that makes a lot of mess when you have assumptions for one and not the other, and importantly, technologically distinct. Lokalile is old one and Boxgrove is Ashley. They are very different. Quick background to Lokalile because I'm not going to focus on it. I looked at site 2C, which <coughs> is the old one flaking and not there are, I think, some hand axes, I'm not sure, because I don't know the other sites. It's one of the earliest hominin sites with lithic reduction. It's located in Western Khan in northern Kenya. It's 2.34 million years old. It's really intensely studied by Delaney's and Rush, who are two French archaeologists, and they've done all the refitting. There is no one else who writes about it, and they give it such wonderful detail. So I couldn't get access to the tool, so I did a literature reanalysis of their refit studies, and using my Chien Apotoir approach, and the stage of the planning I laid out, I figured out that they generally have level four simple planning, that's the mid, mid to long term planning, but it wasn't as complex as what I was finding at Boxgrove, but it was more complex than like Kanzi and his tool making. Kanzi is a bonobo. The selectivity of the raw material I had to ignore because it's really close to site, it's sort of the equivalent of walking back to the sort of common area. Um, so instead, I looked at selectivity. They were incredibly selective for a type of a lava cobble called funnelite, <coughs> and this is probably because it's really easy to work out the fracture fastening because it sort of builds in layers so it breaks in nice obvious ways and that I found showed a more complex level of planning of five and seven which is short term and long term but no mid term planning because they can easily work out how to crack it to get it back to site in smaller lumps but also how to crack it in ways they can get the most flakes out of it because at Lokalilo they're looking for the number of flakes not just the quality of flakes. <coughs> and my other site, as has already been mentioned today, is Boxgrove. It's in West Sussex and it's just a beautiful place with a nice beach nearby if you ever go, um, which I finally went to last week. I looked at three of the quarries, 2A, 1A and 1B, because they have the most refit data available and it's the most up-to-date research. Um, it's 0.5 million year old Ashalean site. There is Homo herdelbergensis remains, but I, like I said, I ignored species if possible. Um, I think it's worth noting that it was originally thought of as a snapshot of time because there is one assemblage where you can kind of see where the Napa st stood on knelt and there's a scatter around them and you can sort of place the person. But Langbrook in the image on the right noticed that there were actually three distinct phases of napping and creation, debitage, and they're both spatially and temporarily temporarily distinct, so I think of it more as like a flick book where like <coughs> half the pages have just gone missing and it's the archaeologist's jobs to put them in. Here is the site-specific chain of um, I developed. We're just going to look at the ones in red because that's the one where the most detail I found, the most difference between this site and Lokalilo was. So stages two and three were core preparation, roughing out and initial debitage creation. And generally it was kind of what you'd expect for the Ashley and some hard hammers, some soft hammer. What was the most interesting is Scatter 1 rough outs had characteristics of soft hammer strikes and until I think the early 2000s no soft hammers were found on site and this is a really intensely excavated site. Eventually they did find these lovely shell antlers but before that there was lots of experimental archaeology with um, the pebbles on the beach and none of that came out as they expected. Luckily, shed antler was found, and so we know that we have the soft hammer that you see on the left. This is interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, there's no deer remains in the area, so that has to have come from elsewhere. Two, shed antler is seasonal. You have to understand seasonally, like seasonality, or just be really lucky in finding it. And three, it's very difficult to work. You have to crack open a hard shell, take out the soft hammer, nap it into shape, remember where you were doing your original mapping in the first place, bring it back to box grove, get your chalk and start working there. So it's a really long process. There was definitely level seven, complex, probable multi-person, very long-term planning. I just think it's kind of cool. Um, what I really like about this one is originally they didn't know it was antler because it was so worn beyond recognition because this was such an intensively used 
soft hammer, but the hand axes you see on the right, almost no microware. What they were doing at Boxer is they were really intensively making hand axes, taking them away from site, bringing in other hand axes and just not really using them so people don't know what the hand axes were for. Um, the hand axes are useful to look at the later stages, which is deposition and removal and introduction to site. As I was saying, <coughs> these are from Quarry 2A and none of these hand axes match any of the debitage from the site and all the debitage when refitted has no hand axes to match them. So clearly there's a level of forethought and planning that is taking the hand axes away from site and another level where people are bringing them in. For what reason, I have no idea. But maybe a large transport system. So hopefully that very brief summary of my results has shown that stone tool production sites and assemblages can be used as markers of different planning levels and cognition. So I'm now going to very quickly take you through the wider context of the cognitive studies. So Old One is thought of as either really moving forward in time, away f like in cognition away from apes, or not much is happening, it's just a leap in um, tool making. And so obviously we do a lot of human chimpanzee comparisons, and they show us that chimpanzees and bonobos are more complex, but we don't know why. My most interesting case study of this is Kanzi, who was taught to make stone tools in the proper Ashleyan way, or old one flaking way, but just refuse to and throw the rocks at the ground to try and get the most flakes, because he has an abstraction that he can understand that if I smash the rocks, flakes come out, but not necessarily applying that to things that aren't tool making. So that shows decision making, but not necessarily full learning. And that links to this thing called the prefrontal cortex and your frontal poles, which are just here, and there where all your decision making comes from, and also planning. It's kind of like the physical conscience. So it's the most elaborated area of the brain in all primates, but more so in humans than any other species of primate. In particular, apes, we are greatly improved from them. And the prefrontal cortex has neurons which um, they encode these actions and turn them into behavior guiding rules and it's how we dictate all the decision making we do. So we know that um, Kanzi can like smash the rocks, he knows what's going on there, but he can't abstract the rule from it, whereas humans can go, ah, if I do this, I can take that, and I can apply this thought to other things that I do, and it's all a mess of working memory, which I'm sure Charlie can explain much better than I can. So if we take Kanzi as an example of the last common ancestor, we can see that Lokalile in the old one in general is more complex than that, so I called it simplified complex, and then Boxgrove is even more complex than that because they were able to not only um, exploit napping angles in rotating the core, but exploit them to the point where you can make full hand axes and not just more um, flakes than previously. And finally, uh, I have a lot of grudges to bear with the way we talk about cognition in archaeology. I think we use a lot of outdated terms, such as primitive, and we're quite egotistic as humans because we place a lot of... Uh, pressure on the past and we talk about it as though we've succeeded in reaching the maximum peak of complex cognition and I think it's something worth remembering that we talk about Kanzi as either being really special for his species or his entire species as not being impressive at all. I think that as I've sh hopefully shown through my talk there is a lot more nuance in the archaeology and in the cognition. There was actually very little difference between Lokalile and Boxgrove but once I started making my own inferences and applying it in comparison to Kanzi and other bonobos like Pambanisha, his sister, there was very subtle changes that you can only really see when you start to plot them on a graph and line them up. So, thank you.